So we are reading Goonie Bird and the Room Mother, and we're reading our final two chapters today. So last time we know they were getting ready and um, the teacher was worried that um, the play was going to be a slapdash play kind of thrown together, but the kids assured her that it would be good. So we'll see how, how it turns out. Those look like leprechaun cupcakes with leprechaun hey, hats. It's pilgrims, a pilgrim hat. All right, but they look like nine. a leprechaun hat. It was the day before Thanksgiving vacation, the day of the pageant. The school janitor, Lester Ferrillo, had masking tape to attach the mur mural to the wall of the multi-purpose room and he had set up folding chairs for the audience. At the back of the large room, a table covered with a yellow paper tablecloth held two large platters of cupcakes and two pitchers of lemonade. These cupcakes are spectacular, Mrs. Pigeon had said when she opened the boxes that held them. Look at this, little turkeys and pilgrim hats on the frosting. How did she ever do that, Goonie Bird? She didn't do it, Goonie Bird replied. You saw who brought them. You saw the name on the van. I think it's on the boxes too. <clears throat> Creative catering, Beanie read from the lid of one box. I thought the room mother was supposed to make the cupcakes herself, Trisha said. Goonie Bird shook her head. I just told her to provide cupcakes. Remember the dialogue from when I told the story about getting the room mother? She asked what the room mother had to do. And I said, provide cupcakes. You all know what provide means. We don't even need to get out our dictionaries. Well, Mrs. Pigeon said, as she arranged the cupcakes on a platter, she certainly did a good job of providing, didn't she? but I wish she had brought them herself. I'd like to thank her. She's coming to the pageant, Goonie Bird assured her. <clears throat> and now in the afternoon, the guests were arriving. The second graders were all in the small adjoining room, peeking out, watching the chairs in the multi-purpose room fill up. There's my mom, Tyrone said in an excited voice. Look it, she's got such a cool dress on. Mom, he called her, I'm back here. Tyrone's mother looked up with a grin and waved. Shh, the other children said. Nobody's supposed to know, what, see us yet. This is the dressing room, Ben explained. We're backstage, we have to be quiet. Hey, he added, look, there's my mom. My daddy came, Keiko said, peeking out. He must have closed the store for the afternoon. Look, there he is with my mom. And see, there's my auntie. Hello, Obachan, she called. And a woman laughed and fluttered her fingers in a wave. <clears throat> Mrs. Pigeon had been at the door of the multi-purpose room, get, greeting the guests. Now she came back to where the children were waiting. I hear some giggling back here, she said with a smile. Are you all ready, she asked. We'll start in a few minutes. Not quite everyone is here yet. The room mother hasn't arrived. Oh, she might be a little late, Goonie Bird explained. She said we could start without her. Oh, look, Goonie Bird pointed. There's my mom, see? She's the one in jeans with the smiley face sweatshirt. She wiggled her fingers in a wave and her mother waved back and took a seat. There was a sudden commotion at the door of the multi-purpose room and several people got up from their seats to help. Malcolm looked and groaned. Oh, it's my mom, he said, with the triplets. He covered his eyes. I'm not going to look, he said. Mrs. Pigeon put her arm around Malcolm. She and the other children watched <clears throat> while the janitor and several others helped maneuver the huge triple stroller through the doorway. Are they asleep? Malcolm asked, still holding his eyes. Please, please, could they be asleep? Yes, they seem to be sleeping, Malcolm. It's okay, you can look, don't worry, Mrs. Pigeon told him. We won't even mind if they wake up, we like babies. 
I love babies, whispered Felicia Ann. I hope those triplets wake up so I can hold them. <clears throat> they always smell bad, Malcolm whispered back. He stuck out his tongue and crossed his eyes. Mrs. Pigeon went to the piano at the front of the multi-purpose room and played a few chords to make people stop talking. It was what she did in the classroom and it always worked there. It worked here too with the grown-ups. They all became silent. Mr. Leroy walked to the front of the room. The multi-purpose room didn't have a stage, but he stood in front of the audience wearing a necktie today with a plump turkey on it. And he spoke in a loud, clear voice, just the way Mrs. Pigeon had told the children that they should. The second graders listened from behind the cracked open door to their dressing room. Here's Mr. Leroy. Uh oh, it's getting a little blurry. Let me fix that quick. Oh, do you see the kids peeking out on the side here? Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Leroy said. I'm delighted to see so many parents here today and some grandparents I see, and even a few little brothers and sisters. And an auntie, whispered Keiko. <clears throat> Are your triplets brothers or sisters? Felicia Ann asked Malcolm. Shh, Malcolm said, I'm not saying. And perhaps our new room mother as well, Mr. Leroy said in a cheerful voice, looking around the audience. Would the second grade room mother like to stand? Maybe she's a little shy, he went on when no one stood, but she certainly did provide wonderful refreshments, which we will enjoy after the performance. Speaking of the performance, I would like to mention that this is the fifth and final Thanksgiving pageant today. I watched the kindergarten children this morning. They did quite a lively dance during which they gobbled little turkeys, like little turkeys and flapped imaginary wings. It was a little noisier than we had expected, but we got it under control after a bit. And I think we learned quite a bit about how dangerous wing flapping can be actually. For those of you who heard about it and are worried, incidentally, little Chloe McAllister is going to be fine. Nothing more than a fat lip. Mr. Leroy straightened his tie. After that, he went on, the fourth grade performed quite an impressive play about Captain Miles Standish, <clears throat> who arrived on the Mayflower and the great Indian Massasinot, who became his friend. Unfortunately, Jason Carruthers and Jeffrey Hall, who were to play the roles of Miles Standoff, Standish and Massasinot, are both absent today because there seems to be a stomach virus making the rounds. The other fourth graders, though, did a great job of explaining what the play would have been like if the leading characters had been available. Next, the first grade had worked hard on learning all the words of the traditional Thanksgiving song, We Gather Together, and they sang it with a remarkable enthusiasm for the audience. Unfortunately, their teacher had not taken into account how difficult the lines he chastens and hastens his will to make known the wicked oppressing now cease from distressing would be for people whose front teeth had recently fallen out. And I believe that was 14 of the 18 first graders, but their gusto made up for their pronunciation. And finally, just an hour ago, we had the third grade's very colorful reenactment of the first Thanksgiving dinner. The third grade is so fortunate that one father provided large cardboard cartons, one for each performer to wear, with their heads, of course, emerging from the tops of the cartons and each decorated as a type of food, squash, corn, potatoes, and the like. The third graders got the most of the way through a recitation and demonstration of the various courses of that dinner. I think actually that might have been the food descriptions that brought on an onslaught of the stomach virus mid-performance so that we had some unfortunate events during which we had to extricate several children quickly from their cartons and we ended up with a very slippery floor. Both of the DeMarco twins threw up, Barry Tuckerman announced to the other children. Identical throw-ups. I heard the janitor telling Muriel Holloway, Oh, no, wailed Keiko. Shh, 
Cuckoony Bird said. But our hardworking custodian, Lester Ferrillo, has taken care of that, Mr. Leroy went on. And with the help of some air freshener, I think we're in good shape for our final performance of the day for Mrs. Pigeon's second grade. Thank you again for coming. I see someone else is just arriving. Is that another stroller? He peered toward the back. My goodness, so many vehicles today. Lester Ferrillo, will you help? We'll help you in. There are still some seats in the back. Please make yourself comfortable. Mr. Leroy gestured toward the chairs in the back as more people entered. Then he turned to the piano and said, Mrs. Pigeon, it's all yours. Mrs. Pigeon smiled. She played a verse of We Gather Together to call the crowd to attention and to create a Thanksgiving mood. Then she nodded to Goonie Bird, who was in the doorway, waiting for her cue to enter. Chapter 10. This is our final chapter. While Mrs. Pigeon played a rhythmic drumming sort of music on the piano, Goonie Bird Green danced from the door to the front of the multi-purpose room. Her dance was a combination of shuffles, taps, and twirls with an occasional pause for a hop. She was wearing fuzzy bedroom slippers, her long velvet skirt, a flowered Hawaiian shirt, and a top hat onto which she had attached a blue feather. The audience applauded at her entrance. She ended her dance and bowed dramatically, steadying her hat with one hand. I am Squanto, Goonie Bird Green announced. And these, she gestured to the children, and they entered the room, marching, wearing their costumes of cardboard hats and headbands and belt buckles, are pilgrims and Native Americans. They are Squanto's friends, she added. Here's everybody entering. The pilgrims and Native Americans stood in a semicircle behind Goonie Bird. They all adjusted their headgear and then stood with their hands at their sides, wiggling their eyebrows to hold up their hats and headbands, which were already slipping forward on their foreheads. Now, in honor of Thanksgiving, I'm going to tell you a story, Goonie Bird said. Mrs. Pigeon played a ta-da piano chord on the piano. The audience clapped and laughed. All of them knew already because they had been told by their children what a good storyteller Goonie Bird Green was. Even Barbara Green, Goonie Bird's mom, clapped and laughed. From behind his headband, which had settled across his nose, Malcolm muttered, I hope they don't clap too loud and wake up those triplets. Goonie Bird took a few deep breaths, adjusted her posture and began. I am not the actual Squanto. The real Squanto was a Patuix, I don't know how to pronounce that, Patuix Indian who was born in a village Within near- the index. Yeah, there's not an index because this is a fiction book. Um, oops. Uh, let's see, where was I? Uh, who was born in a village near where the pilgrims would land. But when he was born, they hadn't landed yet. He learned to speak English from some early settlers. He helped them in many ways. He was a very helpful guy. When some of them went back to England, they invited him to go along. His mother didn't want him to. I can understand that. My mom wouldn't want me to go off to another country. She would say I was too young. We would probably have a big argument about it. Oops, Goonie Bird said. That was an authorial intrusion. I didn't mean to do that. It's boring. But he went away. This is this was way back in the 1600s. Squanto is dead now. I am not the real Squanto. I am an imitation. <clears throat> Mr. Leroy, Goonie Bird said, could you tell us the meaning of imitation, please? The principal looked up and cleared his throat. Oh, uh, well, uh, he said with a nervous little laugh, uh, it means fake. You are a fake Squanto. Goonie Bird looked behind her at the semicircle of pilgrims and Native Americans. Barry, she said. Barry, pushing his headband up on his forehead, stepped forward. 
Imitation, Barry said in a loud voice, something made to be as much as possible like something else. He bowed and stepped back. Everyone, including Mr. Leroy, clapped. Thank you, Barry, Goonie Bird said. To the audience, she explained, Mrs. Pigeon has taught us all to use the dictionary. We have gotten very good at it for second graders because we didn't underestimate ourselves. Underestimate? Beanie? Goonie Bird said. Beanie stepped forward. She stumbled a bit because her hat was over her eyes. Then she righted herself, stood straight, and said, underestimate, to judge things as less than their real value. She curtsied and whispered, like I underestimated the bigness of my hat. The audience laughed and clapped. Goonie Bird continued the story. After a while, Squanto got tired of being in England. <clears throat> it was noisy and everybody went shopping all the time. He was homesick, so he cajoled the sea captain into taking him back to America. Felicia Ann, Goonie Bird announced, Felicia Ann, her pilgrim bonnet completely covering her eyes and nose, stepped forward shyly. Cajole, to persuade someone to do something by flattery or gentle argument, she said in her small voice. The audience clapped and Goonie Bird continued. He traveled around for a while being helpful because he was a helpful guy. He was an interpreter between the Americans and the Indians. Malcolm, Booney Bird said, interpreter. Malcolm unbent his green feather, straightened his headband and wiggled his fingers the way he always did when he was nervous. He hesitated a moment thinking, then he said, interpreter, someone who translates something from one language to another and helps people understand each other. The audience clapped. Shh, Malcolm told them with his fingers to his lips, don't clap too loud. But suddenly the children smiled in anticipation, in anticipation at the suddenly. A bad ship captain tricked him into going into his ship. It was a big scam. They made him a captive and took him to Spain. The captives were all sold as slaves. It made Squanto pretty mad, but he was indefatigable. Goonie Bird grinned. Tyrone, he said. Tyrone, his headband completely covered in beads and with two feathers attached, strutted forward proudly. Inde indefatigable, he proclaimed, never showing any sign of getting tired. Thank you, Tyrone, said Goonie Bird after the applause. I'm going to flash forward a bit now. That's a thing authors do. After a long time, Squanto finally made his way home. He had been away for many years. And when he finally got home, he found that his village was gone. His people had all died. He was the last of his tribe. It was very sad, but he became friends with the great chief Mass Massasot. And after a while he met pilgrims who had just arrived, arrived. So he had some new friends and they hung out together. The pilgrims lives in America would have been a fiasco if good Indians like Squanto had not helped them. Chelsea, fiasco? Chelsea waved to her mother at the front row. Fiasco, a total failure. Chelsea curtsy, curtsied and gave a thumbs up sign. Goonie Bird finished her story. Squanto had gotten lots of new clothes in England and he had learned to dance, the end. Goonie Bird bowed, twirled in a circle and did a small bit of hula. All of my story was absolutely true, except maybe the part about learning to dance, but I think he probably did, Goonie Bird said. The audience rose to their feet, clapping and cheering. From the back of the room, when the applause quieted, the sound of babies crying became came from the huge stroller. Malcolm pulled his headband down over his eyes and groaned. I have a couple more things to say, Goonie Bird announced. <clears throat> the first Thanksgiving is a really good story because it tells about people becoming friends and being helpful to each other and being thankful. So some of the second graders want to say what they are thankful for. Nicholas, Nicholas, 
said loudly, the Muriel. I got to do the forest part and Mrs. Pigeon, she stretches our skills. Next, Goonie Bird said, Keiko, my family, Keiko said, and Mrs. Pigeon, she makes me smile. Ben, Ben hopped up and down. My fixed broken arm, he held it up. And Mrs. Pigeon, I like her songs and she lets us change socks. One more, Goonie Bird said, and then we can have our refreshments. Malcolm? Malcolm sighed. Slowly, he walked forward. He looked toward the big stroller. Okay, I guess I'm thankful for my triplets, he said after a moment. Their names are Taylor, Skyler, and Tier Tierney. And two are boys and one's a girl, but I don't know which is which. And I'm thankful for Mrs. Pigeon because she is very calm, even when I'm not. And I'm thankful for the room mother because she brought cupcakes and I'm hungry. From the back of the room, a voice called out. I didn't. Oh, is this our room mother? I didn't bring them. I provided them. There is a difference. Then very slowly, an elderly woman stood, lifting herself up by the arms of her wheelchair. Next to her, a nurse reached out to steady the chair. Here's what I'm thankful for, the old woman continued. <clears throat> I'm thankful that Goonie Bird Green called me on the telephone and asked me to be the room mother. I haven't been room mother for 35 years. I was room mother when my daughter Patsy was in second grade. It was fun then and it will be fun now. And mostly I'm thankful that Patsy became a teacher. It makes me proud. She lifted one hand and waved to Mrs. Pigeon, seated at the piano. Mrs. Pigeon dabbed her eyes with a hanky and then waved back. Hi, Mom, she said with a smile. And don't forget, Goonie Bird Green, the room mother said, you promised me a special song. Goonie Bird looked at Mrs. Pigeon. Class, Mrs. Pigeon said, and played the first chord. Room mother, the children sang. The end oh so it was mrs pigeon's mother this whole time that was the room mother that's fun